Welcome everyone. So in this test video I wanted to show some basics to analysis. A common question I often get is how to analyze your own chess games. So this is a really important skill to have and so I thought why not just make a video on it. So here I want to kind of go over some of the basic terminology and concepts you should be using when you analyze. It's a very useful thing to have, you know, because back in the day before computers, we had to do this by ourselves, you know, move by move and try and figure things out as we go. But now that we have chess computers that are so strong, much stronger than even the top grandmasters today, you know, it's such a powerful tool that if we have a computer at our side after the game, it's almost like having your own personal chess coach who is like a grandmaster. So, all right, let's just get right into it then and show exactly how we analyze our own games. So here, this is just my most recent um, rated rapid game, but it's nothing special other, other than that. And so the first thing we have to do here when we analyze is, you know, kind of learn the basics of the setup. So all I did here was I just went to the analysis board, you know, after the game. So it'll look roughly like this. And so after you do the game report, um, so when the game report comes up, it's this review here. And so here you have what's known as the CAPS, which is your accuracy. Um, CAPS is an acronym. It stands for computer aggregated percentage score. Um, so that's what CAPS means. And so basically it's your accuracy for the game. So it's pretty much this percentage here. And this is a bit misleading as far as what it looks like because it looks like I scored 84% accuracy, which is true in that sense. Um, but that's kind of misleading the fact it makes it sound like I found the best move 84% of the time. And that's sort of right. That's not entirely true. Um, it's actually not even possible to get like an accuracy below I think 50% or 30% or somewhere in there with the exception of it being zero. <laughs> so there's some weird mathematical things that go on here in how this percentage is calculated. Maybe in a future video I could go more in depth if people are interested in it. But at least for the time being know that this is a mathematical calculation here and similar to my opponent. So you know you have to keep that in mind when you're doing this. But basically the higher percentage score the better. So 100% would mean that you found the best move that lined up with the computer 100% of the time. Extremely unlikely even for top players today. What's more likely is you'll get like 80s or 90s or 70s or somewhere in that ballpark regardless of your rating. And so this is more like you're basically a report card. You know so if you have like 90s and higher Basically, it's like you got an A for that game. And if you're in the 80s, like I have in this game here, this is kind of like a B for me. So this is, you know, not too great, but not too bad. You know, and then similarly, my opponent here, they have a 75. So it's mostly like they got a C in this game. So it's very informal, but it's a good way to kind of get a quick representation and how you feel like you did in the game. Now, over here, we have this, you know, chart with these little lines here with this, the white and black. So that's who's winning throughout the game. And so in this game here, we see that this goes down a lot. And so the black is the black side and the white is the white side. So in this game, as it goes down more, black is winning more and more. So this game was pretty balanced for my part. You know, I was pretty consistent in this one, um, but not always will it look like that. You know, even for myself, sometimes there'll be a lot of ups and downs way bigger than these. And those are fluctuations as the game goes more back and forth. Um, and then down here we have um, the brilliant moves, the great moves, best moves, excellent moves, good moves, book moves, and then all of basically all the errors. So these are the important ones here. All the errors are what we really want to focus on because that's how we learn from our mistakes. So a blunder is the worst. So those are the moves that you definitely want to avoid. Usually that would be something like you hang your queen in one move, maybe you fall into a forced checkmate, something like that would probably be considered a blunder. Now, very similar, we have miss, which used to be called missed win. Now, miss is kind of short for, like, missed opportunity. And so that could really range as far as how bad it is or not based on the position. But it's probably somewhere between inaccurate to a blunder based on the exact position, how bad it is. But those are two very important categories that we need to look at. Next, in this orange color here, we have mistakes, how many mistakes were in the game. And this is also very important to look at. And then finally, we have inaccuracies in this yellow, which are not quite as bad as mistakes and blunders, but there's still moves that perhaps there was a better move that the computer sees than what was actually played in the game. Now, when you first start out in analyzing your own games, I recommend just analyzing your blunders and your mistakes and don't even worry about the inaccuracies in yellow until you get a little higher rated. There's no number that I tell you, you know, you have to be a certain rating to pay attention to inaccuracies, but when you become more comfortable with the analysis tool, then you can start branching out to inaccuracies. And the reason I don't want everyone starting out with inaccuracies 
as that important is because there's such subtle difference between that and the best move that if you're not really a high rated player it's not really worth their time trying to investigate those because quite frankly they're very similar in valuation um, so when you get higher and your opponents have a much less margin of error then you can start paying attention a lot more to the inaccuracies and trying to find out what the exact best moves are but really just avoiding blunders and mistakes is a big key Okay, so let's actually go to the game and kind of show what it looks like. I'm not going to go over the whole game here, but I'll show kind of briefly some more terms and how we analyze our own games. So here, um, the first thing moves, all these will be book moves, which is opening theory. So this is a little book icon here. And like I said, I'm not going to go through all of these, but you know, these will be book moves for quite a while. And then somewhere in the middle game, I'll just click somewhere here. Um, like here, we're well out of opening theory. And so this is the more the meat of the game. You know, this is the part we really want to get to and try and analyze. When you're trying to analyze your own games, I like to go move by move and start from move one and go with the arrows down here and kind of very briefly just go through the entire game one move at a time and look at what the best moves are recommended compared to what moves I play. Um, but especially pay attention to mistakes and blunders. So those will be the dark red will be the blunders and the mistakes will be orange. So in this game, I actually don't have any blunders or mistakes. Um, but our first thing here for us is on E5 coming up we have a miss, which is a missed opportunity that's more or less like a mistake, and so we need to look at, well, where could we have improved on that point? Um, when you get a little higher rated, or when you get more comfortable, it's also important to analyze the opponent's mistakes. Like right here, my opponent just played G3. And so in that case, I would actually analyze that myself, because even though that's our opponent, sometimes we can learn from our opponent's mistakes. Um, so really, I like to look at both sides, but if you're just starting out with analysis and you're a little uncomfortable with that, then just focus on your own side. So in this case, what I would do is I would look at what move is actually played, whether it be my opponent or my side doesn't really matter. So if they play G3, I have to say, okay, this is a mistake according to computer. So what's a better move? So Bishop E3 is a better move. And okay, well, we can reason that. You know, if you know about opening principles, you know that generally you want to get developed. And so developing a new piece off the back rank is probably a good idea. Bishop e3 is best according to the computer. It's a pretty logical move. It controls the center, develops a piece, it also connects the rooks, you know. So it does a lot of good things. Similarly, g3 actually kind of weakens their king a lot because now your king is a little bit more exposed because generally you don't want to be pushing pawns right in front of your king. So kind of looking at those things, it's easy to understand why g3 might be a mistake and a move like bishop to e um, e3 is actually better. Now that kind of brings me to my next terminology I want to share, which is pretty important when you're analyzing, is how do we know how much better a move actually is? And so here on the very left side, there's this bar here. So if white is winning, it's going to be a higher number. It'll be plus whatever. And then if it's a lower number, then that'll be negative, which will be, in that case, black is better. And then if it's 0.0, .0 that means it's exactly equal in that position. So here, if you can see this, we have a negative 0 0.2, um, negative 0 0.27 if I ho hover over this. And so that means that black is ever so slightly better in this position. Now, how much better? Well, this refers to something called centipawns, which is only a really something computers use. Humans don't really use the terminology like that. And so centi comes from the prefix for 100. And so one centipawn is literally one hundredth of a pawn. So that's a very minuscule you know, estimate there that we have. Computers are very precise, humans aren't. Most people can't even you know, worry about half a pawn or a full pawn, more or less one hundredth of a pawn. But okay, so here, this is the evaluation of the position. So in this case, let's just round, let's just say negative 0 0.2. So that's 20 you know, centipawns that black has had. So about one-fifth of a pawn. Now, if we look at the material, material is equal. So basically, material-wise here, we're even. But in the position, basically the computer feels that black is basically about equal. You know, only one-fifth of a pawn better is black. So it's pretty close in even position that we picked here. Now, after the mistake here with g3, see now we have 0 0.8 in black's favor. So negative 0 0.8 which is a big difference. That's almost an entire pawn of material, even though material is equal. So, you know, those small little differences, they can actually add up. Now, if something isn't as obvious as one move, then we come over here and we take a look at all these lines here. So these are the variations that you can actually show. These are the top computer moves. And we'll notice that as the engine runs deeper and deeper depth, 
then these lines are going to change what moves there actually are. Now the depth is up here, and so that is this number right now. Right now we are at depth 25. On the regular chess.com game report, it only goes up to depth 20, and so you would need a higher membership to go deeper. Right now it's going at 26, now it's 27, and as we wait longer and longer, it's going to go deeper and deeper as the computer keeps looking further and further ahead. Now depth refers to how many moves the computer is looking ahead, but it's not to literal moves, because here we're at depth 28, and so it's not actually 28 moves, it's actually 28 ply that the computer looks ahead. And so ply is like half a move. Um, so if we go to the very start of the game, so e4 is one ply, that is white's one move. And now if we play a move like c6, well c6 is black's first move, but that's their second ply of the game, because this was one move, sorry, not the king. Um, so the pawn was one movement with the pawn, that's one ply, and then the second ply is our pawn move. But together, this is the first move of the game, because white is moved, and now black is moved, and that is move one. And so like d2, d4, and then d5, this is move two, even though there have been four ply that have been played. So the computer um, when it says this depth, this is referring to ply. So you would kind of have to cut it in half to find how many moves. So if you're at depth 20, that would mean that the computer is looking 10 moves ahead which is pretty far. You know, again, I said these computers are very strong. Um, but back here, when they play G3, um, so basically what we have here is, based on how deep the computer is, we see all these lines. And these lines are the evaluation on, if we go in all of this line here that it shows, then here's the evaluation that the computer gives. And it does that for as much as you look at. And so this is really useful because if like G3 wasn't so obvious, like why that's a mistake, you could actually follow all of the moves here, or at least kind of go through mentally, or even play a few on the analysis board, and trying to figure out why that move is not so good. And if you think a move is better, well, you can actually play it. Like, I know this is a silly example, but let's just say, for example, I thought knight g4 was, like, better for me. Obviously, it's not, because it's going to hang my knight. They could just take it in one move, right? You know, this would be a very obvious blunder on my part. But let's say that I didn't see that. So I would actually go over here to the analysis lines, and I would look at these lines. And I'd say, okay, well, which line is really good for white? And well, this one is over plus 2, plus 2.43. And the others are pretty close. So if I didn't know what the best move was, this gives it away. Because this is much higher valuation than this, much better in white's favor. And so what move is that? Well, the first move here is F captures G4. And so I can actually put that on the board and show... Oh, okay, F captures C4, it takes the knight, and so that's why it's a blunder. But if it's not a one-move blunder, there will still be mistakes, but you follow this, these lines, and it'll show you what, you know, the best moves are. And oftentimes you'll see a tactic, or a forced mate, or you'll lose material, or something. And once you kind of have the idea of why something was played, then you can kind of move on to the next few moves. So here, let's go to E5. So here, this is a miss. This is something important to look at. So why is E5 not so good? I thought I would strike in the center, and it attacks the knight. Now, black is still winning, because we are negative 0.5 here, and so that's about half a pawn in black's favor, even though material is equal. But what was better? Well, it looks like the computer is recommending a5 is even better. That would be like negative 1.59, so that'd be about a pawn and a half better in black's favor. Better than a one pawn advantage of this line with e5. So what's the difference? Well, this might be a little more advanced to figure out, and if you're a higher rated player, maybe you can understand this. But even if you're not a high rated player, just having the computer, it can literally tell you if you follow these lines. And so I think with A5, the idea is, is that whenever we play A5, we actually have a real strong threat of playing A4. And that's going to kick the snipe back, and that's actually a really annoying move for them. Whenever we play A5 here, they probably want to stop us from advancing the spawn. So how would you stop it? Well, probably A4 comes to mind. But the problem is here, a4 they can't play because then that would take the knight for free. Because that would remove the defense of this knight from the pawn. So if a4 can't actually be played, and they can't stop a5 to a4, this might actually be a good move for us. And that's why the computer probably says it's best. You know, it just gains some space, it really annoys this knight, and then we continue with the game. So here it looks like my opponent might have made a few mistakes here. Um, not too many. But it looks like because there's no color here, for the rest of the game, I didn't make any more mistakes or blunders. Um, and I don't see inaccuracies because that would be in yellow. So I guess we can kind of move on. 
and I'll show maybe an example that would look a little bit more representative, I think, most people. Um, so let's go out of this game. Okay, so here I went back really far. So this is a game from 2017, back when I joined chess.com, and this game was played within a week of when I joined. Um, so I'm back at 1100 rating, a um, long time ago. Um, but here we can see that in this game, um, there's inaccuracies, which are in yellow, there's blunders, which are in red, there's mistakes, which are in orange here, and, you know, there's a lot of things to look at. And so if I was a beginner here, you know, looking at this, I would mostly be ignoring the inaccuracies, like this move, and, you know, maybe I could know, okay, like a move like d5 might be better, but I don't have to really get that deep into studying why this move isn't best. I can just kind of say, well, okay, mentally make a note that, you know, what the best move is, and kind of move on. Um, but we definitely want to be looking at blunders and mistakes. And so here, the first blunder that we played was rook to d8. So, okay, rook d8. So if we go back a bit in this position here, it looks like we have a slight advantage here. Um, we are literally up by one point of material, if we count the material here. Um, and we have a lot of good things going for, for us. Um, but our last move was a blunder. So we played rook to d8, and so why is that bad? Well, the problem is, I think my opponent actually had better. Um, here, I think, if you know, after we move, you know, our opponent's threatening a few decently strong things here. For example, queen to h5 looks like a really active move against us, and they're already threatening checkmate here. You know, so there's some big problems that we have. In addition to that, they're also attacking our e6 pawn. And right now, if they do play knight takes e6, they might fork our queen and rook. So these are some things that we might have to look out for. Now, I don't know if I saw these back then, because this was many years ago and I was a much lower rate of player. But with the help of the computer, I could find these things. So like here I played rook to d8. And then if I was back then in the post-game analysis, you know, I would be looking at, well, what are the best moves? And so if I had no idea at the moves here, I would look at the engine lines here and I'll go, okay, well, what's the highest move for white? Because, you know, it's white to move here. What could they play that would be really strong? And so here it looks like by far the highest evaluation is over plus four. You know, this second line is only plus one. So what's the move that's plus four? Well, that's queen h5. And so that's the move I mentioned. They have a really deadly threat against us. We probably have to play a move like h6 just to make sure that our queen can't take here. It's a really bad position. This really is a blunder, which is why it was in red. So, okay, so if we can't go there, um, luckily our opponent didn't find that. And so our opponent played knight takes e6. But this is a missed opportunity. You know, queen h5 was better. They probably thought they were winning material because this knight move actually forks both my, you know, rook and queen. And so looking back, if I was, you know, in post-game analysis seeing this, I would think, well, okay, how can I prevent all this? You know, if you make one move mistake, okay, it happens. Um, but not always is it literally the blunder that actually costs you the game. Sometimes it's a few things a little bit before the blunder. And so could I say that I blundered one move, I played rook d8, and that wasn't good? Yeah, I could do that. But maybe I could also say that, you know, the best move here, queen to h5, puts a lot more pressure on my king. And really, how many pieces are defending my king? I don't really see any. I mean, my rook is kind of far. My queen, knight, and bishop are all on the wrong side of the board. You know, so maybe one mental note I could make to myself is maybe my opponent can actually generate an attack on my king if I don't really have any defenders nearby. And so maybe in the future, I'll just kind of have that in the back of my mind and think, hmm, okay, if they have attackers near my king, especially if they have a lot more attackers, maybe I should try and get some kind of defenders near my king. And try and turn every little thing you see into a lesson of why you think that last move was a blunder or why you fell into something and the more mental notes you make like that then the better chance you have of improving later down the road because you it's just repetition you know so if you notice the same pattern over and over where like for example you keep getting checkmated because your king is in the center of the board maybe you'll learn i should get castled earlier so my king is not in the center you know if you hang a lot of pieces in one move then consider maybe i should keep my pieces better defended so you know that way, if they are captured, I can recapture with something. Or you could think, well, if I'm hanging a lot of pieces, maybe I should just kind of do like a little double check thing where right before I move, I double check before I move just to make sure it's not a blunder. So little things like that. And eventually over time, you get better and better at it. Um, but okay, but let's go back here because in this blunder situation, what did I do? Well, my queen was under attack and I probably saw my rook was going to be lost. And so I tried to be tricky here. And I tried to capture their bishop so that if they take my queen with the knight, well, I can take their queen with my rook. Now, the problem is here, that's a blunder because I actually missed something. 
Um, so they can take my rook. And then I actually played e3. Again, this is a mistake, but this will be common because a lot of times people are analyzing, you'll make many things wrong in a row, you know, a string of blunders and mistakes. And so this is why analysis is important. It really helps you understand the moves better so you can improve. So here, what should I have done? Well, I should have tried to defend. I should have kicked this knight out and, you know, try and keep their queen from getting near my king. But here, when I played e3, again, you know, I noticed my queen was attacked. I was probably hoping for them to capture my queen so I could capture their queen, you know, and the game continues. But instead of that, there's this in-between move, which a lot of players here might have seen, which is queen to d8 check. So unfortunately, I have to move my king out of check, but now they can pick up my queen, and their queen is no longer here to be captured. So they've gotten out of this with check, and unfortunately, because of that tactic, I went from a position where I was a little bit better to the blunder with rook d8, and then now this, where I'm just completely losing. And eventually, I did lose this game. Is analysis time-consuming? Well, yeah, it does take time. But it does get easier as you have much more practice at it. So the more that you play, you know, the more that you analyze, it's a skill like anything else, you'll get better at it. And when you first start out, it might take you, you know, 10, 15, 20 minutes to analyze the game, maybe longer. But as you get better, it might start taking 5 minutes and 10 minutes. And eventually, it'll only take you a few minutes to analyze an entire game, and you'll get a lot out of it. Um, so kind of going back, you know, to the general concept, whenever there's a move that is something that the engine says, you should take a look at this, you know, a blunder, a mistake, something like that, anything that's colored like this, you know, you want to be looking, well, what is the best move the computer's recommending? You know, how can I improve? And similarly, what was my mistake? Like, why is this actually a problem? And, you know, what can I do to prevent that in the future? And you just do this over and over and over, and eventually you learn from your mistakes so hopefully that helps everyone. Um, I just want to make a video to kind of help people learn how to analyze with an engine. It's a really useful thing to do. Um, probably if I have to pick one thing that really helped me improve in chess, I'd say analyzing your games is probably the number one thing. It's really important you do that because it prevents you from repeating the same errors over and over. And analyzing your own games is even better than Grandmaster games in some sense because although those players might play at a very high level, you know, your games are tailored to your own mistakes, your own tactics, your own everything, because it's your game. And so it's very likely you'll get similar stuff in future games because that's literally how you play. So analyzing your own games afterwards and learning from those mistakes can really help you a lot down the road. So thanks for stopping by, everyone. Hope this video helped you. I'll see you in the next one.